So I'm going to um, call the meeting of the Finance Committee for December 17, 2020, um, to order at 2.03 p.m. and welcome the Finance Committee, um, which is now one member less than before, which I'll say something more about in a minute. But first, I want to say that pursuant to Governor ba Baker's March 12, 2020 order suspending uh, certain provisions of the Open Meeting Law, General Law, Chapter 30, Section 18, this meeting of the Finance Committee is being conducted um, via remote participation. And in order to um, satisfy the remote participation rules, we have to make sure that everybody can acknowledge that they are and can hear me and be heard. So I'll just go through the list. Kathy? Yes, here can hear you. Lynn? Greece. Yes. Uh, Pat? Yes. Dorothy? Dorothy seems to have stepped away because her room, her room is empty. Uh, Bernie? Yes. And Bob? Yes. <clears throat> OK. Um, as I was saying, uh, just for the public, um, well, oh, Dorothy, I can acknowledge your presence. I've been on the machine all day teaching. He's here. Okay, so we know you're present though. In I'm least, here. At least physically. <laughs> Whether you're still in class mentally, uh, you can't don't have to tell us. Oh, I was going to say is that uh, for anybody who's a um, member of the public uh, who's watching, um, we have one member who resigned from the committee for personal reasons, Sharon Pavanelli, who's a resident member. And uh, the GOL committee of the uh, council um, in its meeting tomorrow will discuss the um, question as to whether to fill a position, how to fill a position, if anyone, um, and including anyone in this committee uh, who's not on GOL has an opinion that you'd like to offer to GOL, uh, please don't hesitate to do so. Uh, the term that Ms. Povinelli was in um, expires um, in June 30, 30th at the end of the year, uh, fiscal year, and so uh, in 2021. So um, that's part of the um, thinking that the committee's going to have, the GOL committee's going to have to go through. So with that, um, I also have one additional agenda item that was unanticipated. Um, and I've sent an email to the um, members of the committee should have received a number of emails. And I uh, hope that um, everybody's had a chance to check their emails. And um, has uh, an email from Sean and a couple from me that have various attachments that can kind of move today's meeting along, I hope. Um, so with that- uh, but Andy, I have them but I just printed them five minutes ago. I mean, when I get something the day of the meeting and I've got classes that day, it means I don't get read before the meeting. But okay, I um, I'm sorry about that. I think that what, but actually it's not that bad and it's a good thing you printed them out. The two that are essential for the discussion that you have not seen before, some of them you've seen before and were being sent, because they're attachments that were helpful to the resident members of the committee who aren't, don't receive the uh, council packet. Yeah. But the two um, are the, the last one that I sent out had two attachments to it. One was in Word and it's a list of um, suggested topics that we should talk about in our first agenda item, which is the, um, uh, proposed guidelines that we want to make to the council for the next year and a series of policy issues. I think but what my thinking about that is, is if we use that list and uh, um, or, or a list that is amended as you may choose, um, that we then 
can talk about each one. And then as the result of that is that we will be, I, I think that I'll be able to do a draft for our next meeting that is based upon today's conversation. And Sean and I did a memo that Sean sent to you, which is for the agenda item that immediately follows, which is the, uh, um, as much as time as we can spend to talk about the inventory issue. And it's just the list of inventory items. Uh, but, um, Lynn, I can put it up on, uh, look for it and put it on the screen that you can. The um, memo that I sent that has the list of possible issues um, for consideration, if you know what I'm referring to. Um, Andy, could I make a suggestion? I have that memo and it truthfully, it looks fascinating, um, but I find size too small. I know sometimes people use a small font size. Or they're embarrassed because it's a long memo, but I'd rather it to be a longer memo and bigger font. And so also when it goes up on the screen, it'll be hard for anyone to read it because it's a small but, font. Um, Dorothy, you can change your screen view to be bigger. Um, there's a view option uh, way up at top and you can do, um, uh, instead of fit to window, you can make it 100% original and it will pop out as a much bigger um, print. Andy, I have a separate issue. Yes, go ahead. Uh, and I, I'm just checking. I uh, have a, I, I guess it's a future agenda item. So I want to make sure that there's a placeholder at the end of the meeting. I'd like to bring up issues around the uh, hiring freeze that we set in the police department. And I'm not sure where to do that. Um, we can put that in there also under unanticipated business. Um, Thank you. Though I'm not sure that it's, a, it, it's any more a finance committee issue, but at least we should talk about it briefly. Uh, so I think, um, the question on this memo, and of course the problem is that it is a list. And um, I hope that you've had a chance to at least look through it and whether there's anything that you think doesn't belong in our discussion or conversely something that you would like to add to the list. And we will come back at the end if there are additional issues that you don't um, have at that uh, at, at the end, that if you've thought of an additional issue, we can also add it at the end. So um, the first run is just, um, if you know of anything immediately that you think is missing or anything that you would propose to eliminate. Otherwise, I would suggest that in order to get this moving, that we uh, just go through this and I will just, uh, as you're looking at it, uh, say that um, it was developed by going through last year's guidelines that were adopted in January, what I, the pre-COVID guidelines. And I uh, just highlighted in each section that I thought was something that we needed to talk about again and then adapted it in order to have us uh, be able to have the list, but it is modeled after last year's pre-COVID guidelines. Um, uh, Bernie, I'm not sure you know, everybody else was involved, but we actually ended up doing two sets of guidelines uh, because we had to do an amended set of uh, council guidelines um, after the COVID crisis hit and we were into a new budget reality. Um, these documents um, I have um, sent to Athena too, as I sent them to you, she gets copies of them. And um, I don't think she probably had a chance to put them in the packet, but- um, I, I'm sorry, Andy, I, I just wanted to pop in real quick and say they are available online to the public now. Okay, so they are in the packet and the packet is available on the website under um, government uh, count, town council to finance committee. Uh, and then you can find the uh, packet there. So um, 
with that said, is there anybody, uh, I see a bunch of hands up and I'm gonna take them in order. I see him, Pat. Oh, I'm sorry, I should have taken that down. That was my interruption from before. Okay. Um, I apologize. I did because I just got my participant list up. Kathy. Um, yeah, you asked about, I'll just do a couple that um, I'd like to add and I don't have a, uh, a place for them, but uh, we heard, we've heard that the collective bargaining agreements are open um, or there will be. Um, and I'd like to put a discussion of that, just brief a couple sentences. And um, it's in the context of we're, we're living with a flat budget, um, a flat dollar budget, and there will be step increases. So I just would put, put it somewhere and I don't have the best place for it. Um, then um, it may go under your other capital needs category, but I'd like to have a sentence or two about the possibility of setting up a maintenance fund. You know, that if we are, if we are investing in a capital project or we have, that we put some money aside to be drawn down and just raise it as a question of whether or not we should do something like that. Um, so that's probably uh, under that piece. Um, and uh, then this one, I really don't know where it goes, but we have a category com called community health and safety and we have racial equity and social justice. And we have asked the town manager to come, we the council, but to come back to us in January with a discussion about staffing and potential alternative staffing. And we froze two positions. So it's under one of his goals and it's either a subheader, but um, we're ex we would be expecting to see in the guidelines and this gets down to a subset of the guideline, something about that um, as a, a making allowance for it. So whether he's talking about an expanded force or a reduction in people we call police and in addition to other kinds of people, I don't know what it is, but just some mention that that's a piece. Um, then uh, two others, um, you know, I'm trying not to get this too big, but under new gen revenue generation suggestions, one thought I had, and this was not original to me, Lynn actually mentioned it, you know, maybe half a year ago. Um, we have an open slot in the town called uh, economic development officer or person. Um, should we in some way think about that person being dedicated to grabbing grants for us, you know, um, a grants getter <laughs> um, in an era where we need them. So focused on getting us grants, um, not just on what else we can do. So I wanted the word grants in. Um, I think that's it. Um, Lynn and I talked about a an idea of, Lynn, um, you have to help me with this, but it's you know, if you wanted to make an investment now, and I'll use solar or there might be others, and you think you're going to get paid back by lower operating costs later with it, is there a revolving fund where you can take a loan out of the fund and then pay it back as you accrue the savings? Could we set something up like that in town? Because as I understand the budgets, you could save money, but you couldn't necessarily keep it for the following year. Um, uh, so it would go back to pre-cash. So it's an investment with, so it makes a loan to do the investment in expectation that you're gonna be able to pay it back because, and I don't know whether what it is because. Um, so that's that would be an example for that. That's it. <laughs> okay, I'll come back and comment on this as, as we go through, um, but I want to get through everybody. Uh, Dorothy? Dorothy Pam, and then Bob Hegner, and then Bernie. Dorothy, did you have something? Okay, I had muted myself. Um, you know, when we're going on our meetings, I was always, I'm constantly being surprised at grants, and they pop up all over the place, and uh, you know, I, I would kind of differ with Kathy in saying make the economic development person the grant person because clearly all kinds of people are getting grants right now. But we don't know. I, I think there must, sometimes I think there have to be surprise grants, but I get the feeling 
that there are grants that people kind of know are come or there's some kind of structure of it, but we in the council don't know anything about that. We only know about it when we get the grant. And so, so many of these grants seem to me, and I'm, I'm probably wrong, but some of them seem to be nice things that are not the basics. It's like jewelry and not the clothing. Um, if we knew that we were getting grants or had a good chance of getting grants for some things, then we might budget or think about, you know, the basic spending differently. So, um, cause I just feel like we're doing this thing at least as a council member in a complete uh, dark room, not knowing that actually this expense is gonna be offset with this grant and that one with that grant. Uh, is there any way to have any kind of sense of how grants, cause clearly they're paying for tons and tons of stuff in our, our town. Um, so anyway, that's, that's my idea that I'm putting out there. It's a question and a comment. Okay, uh, thank you. Bob Hegner? Yeah, I wanted to um, add something to Kathy's discussion of the collective bargaining agreements. And that is whether we want to consider sort of a broad limit on overall salaries and benefits. Like in the, in the, the presentation that we saw last week, it looks like the salaries and, and, and benefits are roughly about 55% of the budget each year over the last 10 years. Do we wanna make that more of a, a target or a goal? Um, that's something to discuss. Um, and then uh, I'm not sure where this fits, maybe under the um, 11, uh, but we should, I, I would like to make sure we touch on the potential decline in the uh, school enrollment population. Okay. And That's Bernie, all. thank you, Bernie. Uh, just to go back and kind of recap some of the stuff that's been said, you know, we're gonna be doing community bargaining agreements. And I think it's important that uh, we stress that the use of reserves are for non-recurring expenses, that we shouldn't be using our reserve funds to fund the operation of the town. Because I know uh, from sort of experience, um, when you're negotiating a, a CBAs, uh, unions will frequently um, go back to those reserve funds and say, look, you have the money. Uh, so I'd really, wanna, I'd really wanna see a stronger statement about the use of reserves. Uh, that would be one thing. Uh, Kathy's suggestion about a revolving fund for projects um, <clears throat> is something I really appreciate because it's it's almost impossible when you start, you, you put something in place and you start saving money um, to track that. But I, I really don't think the Department of Revenue's rules will allow for something like that. But it's a, it, it's a necessary thing to do as you, you know, as you, as you put, put cost saving measures in place. You should be able to, to, to look at those savings and, and say where you're reapplying them. And, and again, that comes from, uh, that comes from sorry experience. Uh, the piece about grants, I think is a good one. I, I think we've got our priorities. And I think under each of those budget priorities, there should be uh, some effort made to catalog grants that will advance those priorities. So we're not doing grants on an opportunistic basis. We're we're doing. We're, we're focused on uh, where we're looking at them. Uh, having an economic development person to help pursue that would be would be helpful, um, and uh, to to get some overall uh, uh, direction and coordination on grant grant effort. Um, can I speak up, please? Yes. Um, I want to go back to the solar fund. This is something that I know that Worcester has actually done. Is something, Andy, we discussed way back when we were doing the um, zero energy bylaw before I was ever on the council and before there was a council. So uh, I, before we say we can't do it, I wanna actually explore and make sure that if there are other towns that have done it, we can. That, that's a good reminder because I find myself getting stuck in the town headset and not the city form of government headset. And cities have considerably more uh, leeway than towns do. So yeah, thank you, Lynn, for that. Um, other than that, people have pretty much brought up things 
I'm interested in the moment at least. Okay, Lynn, thank you for keeping this, for updating the list as we talk. You're, you're so much better at it than I am, which is uh, my, so thank you. Um, so I, I think we need to go back up to the top. I would rather than try and comment on what everybody has said as they go along. Um, I was gonna just, if I had any thoughts about what you said, I was gonna do them as we were going through. So, uh, going to the just taking them in order um, we said in last year's um, guidelines sort of as an initial opening statement that a key factor that was very important to the council was um, fiscal sustainability which can only achieve by looking at multi-year planning and uh, that that was sort of a overarching philosophical statement about budget philosophy, which I think actually came, a lot of these things came from either the select board guidelines or the old finance committee guidelines that ended up in sort of a combined document that became our first year uh, guidelines when we did the FY20, which was the first time the council did guidelines. Um, I, um, I don't know if anyone disagrees with the thought or thinks that in the context of where we are now with uh, COVID budgeting, as I'll call it, um, whether multi-year planning is still um, a goal to uh, try and strive for or people think it's achievable. Uh, so I'll just see if there are any comments on it uh, for Dorothy. Well, when it comes to one of my pet topics, which is sidewalks and roads, if they're not in a multi-year plan, the ones, they don't happen. All that's happened this year in terms of sidewalks is brand new ones, very much needed brand new ones. But people talk to me all the time about some of the terrible sidewalks that have been that way for years and years, and people report it and report it and report it. And so, I mean, obviously, They'll never, ever, ever get done if it's not part of a multi-year thing where we're actually promised that will happen. So yes, we want to have multi-year. Yeah, uh, I, uh, Lynn has just started to add the words capital in there. And um, certainly multi-year and capital um, have been and continue to be. And it's actually built into the charter that there has to be um, I think the charter specifies five years, if I recall correctly. It's five, yeah. And, uh, so that there is the requirement for capital. Um, I think that what the question came up is whether the overall budget, including the operating budget, whether it's uh, we should be thinking ahead. Bob, your hands yeah, up. Yeah, I, 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 I do think that fiscal sustainability and multi-year planning are important goals and important principles. Maybe they're principles more than goals, but I think some of the issues that we will be, that are lower, you know, or further down the list, like use of reserves, you know, th that, that um, impacts or that has an effect on sustainability and on multi-year planning. Um, the, um, the collective bargaining agreements are going to impact multi-year planning, the school, uh, population. So I think a lot of the issues sort of two through X, um, I think sustainability and multi-year planning is a part of what we have to consider. Kathy? Uh, yeah, just building on Bob's, I, I think you use the word overarching or, or overarching, Andy. So this is like, this is the big label and everything else comes underneath it. Um, and I like the idea of principles. And when I looked at it um, to the rest of the world, as well as to us, does fiscal sustainability in itself talk about that we were at least trying to meet essential needs? Um, so we wanna be 
we we can't go out of business as a town. We can't bankrupt the town. But is that part of you know in the context of trying to meet essential, you know, that we may have to make some tough cuts, but we're trying to. Um, and how do I define essential needs? You know, so later when we get to a school budget or something, you know, if we set a school budget that if the enrollment does not drop and the only and this the only way to schools to live with it is to lay off people we would need evidence they could still run the school um you know before we would make that judgment so that's i i just didn't know whether sustainability already has the notion of its we want to be fiscally sustainable over multiple years because we've got to pay for essential services um, or do we need to use those words anywhere? So let me actually, I had some thought about as you were talking last year, what the, um, if you didn't get a chance to read the guidelines that I, uh, which was one of the attachments, because that was a longer document. Um, and uh, but the way that we handled it last year was we said that the current services the town provides are important to our residents and should continue, but that does not mean that there shouldn't be ongoing evaluation of all services and to try and make sure we're, we're providing services in the most cost-effective manner possible. Yeah, no, I like that wording a lot. And it was easier to write those sentences when you start with a fiscal budget at the beginning of the year that was a current a level current services, not a flat dollar. But yes, I like that wording. So I, I raise this mainly as a question, not necessarily to redefine it, but that the we want to be fiscally sustainable to meet these needs. And those later sentences, I think, should stay in the document. I like them a lot. So I have a comment or two on this one. Um, one is that, you know, we often sit here and we will be sitting here and we'll be talking about new things we'd like to see happen. Some of those things will come in response to the community safety. Some of those things will come in response to uh, climate action, et cetera. I think what we need to be very clear about is that we can't commit to something unless we can sustain it. And so there really needs to be that ongoing assessment of not just what will it cost this year, but what will it cost over time? And when, so when I think about this, I don't just think about what do we have now? I think about of what else might go on the wish list. So. Yep. So you would put sustainability of new services or something like that? Yeah. Yep. Does okay. fiscal sustainability mean, mean meeting essential needs? And then I'm saying, if new program, can we sustain it? So it's the questions that came up on if we fix the North Commons, will it look like it does now, 10 yeah. years from now? Yeah. Are we going to keep yeah. it up? You know, that's just an example. I mean, you know, that we can't just pay a lot of money every 30 years to right. make the fact that we let it deteriorate. Yeah. Um, I want to add a little comment. I worked as a waitress years ago with an older waitress who did not wash her hair all week. And then she went to the beauty parlor and had it done. And I thought, that's a horrible way to live. So for one day or two days of the week, she looked great. And the rest of the time, it just got worse and worse and worse because it wasn't the regular normal um, you know, upkeep that should be going on if you're working as a waitress. So I, I totally agree that um, we have to change the practices of this town to be every building, every piece of land that the maintenance hasn't been. And I know that we've got workers who are working very, very hard. So it's gotta be that they haven't been given the resources um, or, or made it or, or put it on the calendar in the right way, or they're having just constantly meeting emergency needs that they haven't been able to do that. I mean, I know they have done a lot of it, but they haven't been able to do as much as we'd like. So I, I don't, I wanna take that back a little bit. Yes, they have maintained many, many things, but we're not able to maintain things, many others as well as we'd like. Thank you. Bernie has his hand up. 
Yeah, um, I, I just basically agree with the point that uh, like to make the point that new new efforts, new programs, new uh, new new tactics don't necessarily mean new money. That we have to be prepared. And this goes in with the evaluation piece. We have to be prepared to say how effective is this, and can we do things faster, better, cheaper, or can we do things differently that gets us further along? Um, I, I think. Uh, maintenance is a, a is a very serious topic. Uh, uh, prop two and a half, when it first settled in, um, set up a perverse incentive. In other words, uh, you, when you look at what first got cut in those budgets after two and a half was maintenance efforts. Because if it broke, then people were more or less forced, forced, to, uh, <laughs> forced to replace it. And I really think we, we need to emphasize for folks. I think we, we, I think we do okay, in my experience here in Amherst. I think staff do well um, to, to, uh, to, to keep things up. Um, but I, would, I, I like the idea of setting up a, um, a maintenance account, especially along with grants, because you can get a grant that starts you off with something and you know, find out that five years down the road, you, you've incurred a new cost. Thank you. Actually, you, this has come up a couple of times. And so at some point, I'm going to ask Sonia or Sean to uh, tell us a little bit about what it is that is feasible to put in regarding uh, specialized funds, revolving funds or uh, dedicated funds of that type, because uh, we don't want to put something in there that can't be done. Sean, your hand. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Andy. So we'll weigh in as we go through each of these. Um, and when we get to that one, we can, Sonia and I can both um, check in. I think in terms of the first, the first number goal, uh, criteria here, that all those things look fine um, from my point of view. Okay. Uh, we should keep moving because we uh, do need to uh, get through a lot of territory today. Uh, so sort of implicit in this, and because uh, it's part of the uh, number one was, but I put it into a, se a separate number, was whether we wanted to um, actually say something about current services and the current services like we did last year, as I described earlier. Current services are appreciated by the community and um, that it's, uh, sort of came out maybe as a presumption level, a rebuttable presumption, but a presumption level. Uh, if anybody disagrees with that, let me raise their hand otherwise, and um, I will go on to the next territory. Sean has his hand up. Yeah, I don't know, Sean, do you have, well, is that your hand? I lowered it and re-raised it just, so I don't know how you want to handle this one. Again, our initial um, projections are for level funding, not level services. Um, if you know the economic situation stays where it is and we do move forward with level funding, it's going to be really hard to, to meet level services. I think we had some positive things for FY21 that allowed us to, to get by, but um, to do that another year with level funding, it Again, you, I'm not saying that it can't be recommended, but just know that that would be a challenge with level funding. Well, we can, uh, are you suggesting, and maybe I should see if the rest of the committee, how the rest of the committee would react to this, is to say that uh, we, we appreciate that current services are important to the community, uh, but if uh, decisions need to be made, uh, the, then they should be clearly stated. Yeah, I think that's a good way to put it. Because again, this, you know, we're, we from even going back to last year, FY22 was the year we expected to be very challenging. Um, and there are some things that could go the right direction for us and, and make it not as bad. But um, I think it is important to somehow get into your guidelines if, if reductions are to be made, you know, yeah, like you said, to, to really clearly state the rationale for them. Any other thoughts, uh, Kathy? Um, yeah, just building on what Sean said, I looked at the wording of our original, uh, the 
December version of guidelines. And I just wanted to change the whole sentence because it's not level services, it is level funding. And to say as the second year of level funding, this is going to be challenging and may require tough decisions. Therefore, you know, efforts to achieve efficiencies, look for places where um, you can live within a budget, but not cut. I mean, just to acknowledge we are not funding at um, a maintenance of current service right up front when we use those two years in a row um, of this. And, you know, what I, what I, I think probably residents in town are aware of this, but as far as I know, we have kept paying people, even though the buildings aren't open and aren't, you know, we have not had to do what UMass has had to do with furloughs. You know, we've let some positions go empty, um, but there's a certain point at which if you're not open for business and you're paying people, some people are still working, but I think we just need to acknowledge that we're in an incredibly unusual time, and this will be the second year of it. So I wouldn't, this first sentence, do we recommend continuation of all current services? I would just flip that around and just phrase it very differently, you know, to right away say, we're in, we're in a, a belt tightening world where we're gonna be living within flat budgets. Um, and we're hoping that people can do what they need to do to, to live within the flat budget without cutting any essential services. I you know, was trying to wordsmith it in my own mind um, to say that. That sounds like you've done a pretty good job actually. Uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, Dorothy? Uh, there's a budget term which I don't know the name of, but it's you can't do something new if you don't have any plan or budget for its upkeep. So here we are talking about doing the North Common, which we all agree is a desirable project, but we have a new park at Kendrick that had to go forward because there were grants and timing and new park at Groff Park. And I'm looking at this and no, although I love the idea of fixing the common, I'm thinking this is like me going out and buying a lot of new clothes I don't need right now, even if I like them, even if I'm sick to death of my clothes, I don't need them and we've got to spend my money elsewhere. So I, I, I think that the, this is part of, I think we have to make some changes and um, I don't see that happening yet. I'm trying to figure out where, is yeah. this related to, related to services? Is it later on related to capital? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, um, Dorothy, you've raised the question a few times, and I think it's probably worth having some response to it. I don't think we can spend a whole lot of time on it today, but the question that you've uh, that's been raised in several ways is that um, are we being consulted about grants or grants being applied for because funds are available for a purpose, or are they being applied for strategically? And uh, how in, in to grants drive our priorities as opposed to priorities driving grants. It's always a little bit difficult because you do apply for grants where you think you can get them. But uh, it, is a, uh, it is a valid point that uh, I don't know how to, how to exactly handle it, but I think at some point we, we probably should talk about it. And uh, I was going to actually bring up some something along these lines in a later discussion when we get to the uh, questions of the financial consequences of the what I'll call the SUFA proposal from let, that we heard about last night. Uh, so we'll come back come back to it within the guidelines and a little might even come back to it a little bit later. Anybody else have any thoughts they want to do that? Otherwise, um, what I, uh, we want to get the next major topic um, is um, when we did the town manager goals, and there's several of us who are involved in the town manager goal process because we also are in the GOL committee, uh, but um, the council adopted. Uh, 
the, the goals for the town manager, which were also then uh, understood to be council's goals. So otherwise we wouldn't be asking the manager to work on them. And um, these are exact copy of the six goals that um, we ended up with in the uh, process. And of course, one of them, and I'm coming back to this on purpose because um, gives Pat an opening to um, talk about something that she had raised earlier uh, before we really got going into this topic of the guidelines. And that is the one that's highlighted now. Uh, I think the word we had thought was is that there was going to be a uh, process that was going to kind of define public safety as we have previously called it and how it is delivered. And uh, I think that the question, if I understood, and if I don't have this right, Pat, I really need you to raise your hand, is that you were asking whether the um, hiring of two police officers in January makes sense if it precedes um, the recommendations that might come from the task force that is just starting to meet. So if uh, that wasn't what you were thinking, Pat, please uh, fill us in. No, that's a, a very good way of stating it. I'm concerned um, because we made uh, what I think was an important um, gesture um, we were looking at people wanting to complete, you know, defund the police 52%. Um, and we said, we said, no, there's going to be a hiring freeze until January 31st, I believe. And that committee, the committee, the community safety working group is barely up and running. It doesn't even have a full contingent of members yet. So it feels to me very important that we maintain that freeze through this fiscal year uh, while that committee gets up and running uh, and really looks at what could be transformative um, in terms of how we see we provide services um, that may or may not need to stay in the police department. Um, so I very much want to bring that back to the council and have us extend that deadline. And I'm not sure what the process is to do that. Yeah, uh, let me uh, respond to a little bit and then go back to Dorothy, whose hand is up um, at this moment too. What the document we're working on right now is the FY22 guidelines. And the issue you're raising in some ways is an FY21 issue mm -hmm. because we adopted a budget in, in the adoption of, when we adopted the budget, we made that request um, that the town manager not fill the position, the two vacant police positions. So it doesn't quite fit into the guideline discussion right. But that doesn't mean that the point you're raising isn't one that's worth uh, bringing to the council. Yeah, Dorothy. I agree with that. And, and I, Pat and I discussed this just very briefly right before the meeting. I suggested it be raised in, in finance because it is a budget issue and that then we need to figure out how to bring it to the council. Okay, so we'll come back to this. Um, Trying to get back to this uh, is additional business at the end Thank uh, you. in the meeting, but I think that we need to recognize that uh, <laughs> we've got the that these are what the guidelines are is about the next year. Dorothy, do you have something you want to yes. say? Um, I I agree with the, the topic that's been raised, but I just wanted to add something about our statements have to be with wiggle room um, in doing a COVID check with one of my classes at the end of the class, just to see if in fact it was spreading. Um, one of my students is a police officer in Holyoke or Springfield. He told me 20 officers that he works with are now have, have COVID. And so, you know, I said, well, 
do your best to make yourself safe. He says, I have to work with the public. So just a reminder that we can say that we think the free should be sustained well, so the committee can get established, which I totally agree with, but we have to make sure that we don't lock people down so that if there's a real problem with personnel because of COVID, um, our police don't have the choice to keep as safe as we might like them to, that we don't get stuck in a corner somewhere. It's interesting, you know, part of the CARES grant has allowed us to hire extra uh, uh, fire and EMS people. Mm -hmm. I don't think, Sean, that it's allowed us to hire um, extra police, has it? Um, we're getting near the end of it. it. It may be able to be used for that if there was a need. Um, okay. if, there was a, if there was a COVID related need. I, I, I'm not sure if I've heard that we've had, you know, a similar experience to what um, Dorothy mentioned, but if, it, if there was a COVID related need, we could probably use CARES money, again, qualifying that we're getting near the end of it. And so the CARES money is less and less. Right. Yeah, so uh, Bernie, I'll get to you in a second, but I think that there's a practical issue with this too. Uh, you just the firefighters that were hired were, um, people who were UMass students who were involved in what is called the student right. call force. So right. they had an association with the fire EMS department already and they had training. Uh, the police officer, as we remember from last summer, uh, there's a long turnover time between the point of hiring and when a police officer can actually provide service and be out on the street. What are they Andy, can I say one other thing real quick that I failed to mention? Yeah. Um, and when, when we do have staff, um, first responder staff who are out of work because they need to quarantine or you know they, they um, have COVID or whatever it would be, um, again, if it's related to COVID, we can use the CARES money to um, backfill for those staff and we have done that. And that may mean somebody else comes in and works overtime to fill a shift on a temporary basis. Um, but that we have done for both police and fire, I believe. Bernie, stand up. Yeah, Bernie? Yeah, I, I think um, it's important to understand, Andy, I think you mentioned it, that you, with a police officer, you can't simply take one off the shelf. Uh, even if you're hiring a police officer who's been through the academy and trained, they still need to have the field training here in town and right. that you're talking weeks or months before you can add someone uh, effectively to, to, the, to the force. That's one thing. The other thing is, is I, I really would like I would hope that the two police officers are, uh, the two, two police positions are seen as a good faith effort on the part of the council to take the task force's work seriously and that people don't anchor on those uh, two positions is that's what we have to work with or that's as far as we can go or that those two positions aren't necessary ne end up being necessary for the successful work of the police force so um, uh, I just my concern is is that people will, will focus on those two positions and, and take that as some kind of a limit and, and I would hope that doesn't happen So I think uh, in this one, we're gonna have to do the best we can in doing a draft, uh, which is the next stage. Um, I think what we have done in prior, uh, the last two years is that I did a first round of the draft and then Kathy did math, massive editing as vice chair to it. And that was then what ended up being the draft for discussion of, uh, we may be doing the same thing again this year uh, so we're going to have to do the best we can with it. I think the, the uh, go back just a little bit to up. So the whole list, um, last year we handled the question of additional, we said something like, here are some additional issues that you, um, that are important to the council. And get, we hope, ask that you give some thought as to how they 
could be um, provided and um, that if additional funds become available um, that you consider these as items for adding to the budget. Um, I'm not sure that um, all members of the council are going to feel comfortable with that sort of a statement this year. And we do, do we need some sort of overarching statement about the additional priorities that are suggested through the goals? Um. Yes, um, John, you had something first, and then I saw, and I see Bob Hegner's yeah, hand. Just real quick, um, I think one thing you might want to consider in the guidelines is if additional funds become available, and we can't maintain level services, that those some of those funds be put towards maintaining level services where it makes sense. Um, right, you know, right. still considering everything else that you have here in terms of reviewing operations and, and making sure we're doing things efficiently. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think that should be at least one consideration. Bob? Yeah, um, I <clears throat> kind of going along with that. I mean, I, I just see that these additional priorities under number three are, um, would be competing against the existing services potentially. And if there is a requirement requirement for additional resources in order to meet these priorities, then those resources have to come from somewhere else. You know, we have to then not do something we would have done otherwise. So I'm not quite sure how to word this, but it seems to me that, you know, we're sort of got, we've got a fixed budget and we can either do as much of what we have done in the past as we can, or we don't do some of that and we do something different, but we, we only have a certain amount of budget to work with. And Andy, I might just add for number, for number three, um, you know, those could be, you know, budget additions, but I also just view those as how the town manager deploys existing resources. Um, and you may want to have comments, you know, related to each one, but um, you know, those overarching goals, are, you know, they're not just about budget additions. It's about how staff are used and how we support um, how we support the goals of the council. So I don't, I don't know if necessarily every one of those has to be, you know, a budget addition item next to it. It could just be how existing resources are used. No, I think that's valid. Mm -hmm. uh, I think when we did this, we recognized that there might be some additional costs, but some things were, as you just described. Uh, housing affordability, there we, we have commitments, but they a lot of that funding comes from doesn't come from the operating budget or the capital budget comes from um, CPA funds and grants and outside funding. It's just um, the climate action is probably a little bit of both. You know, each one has has some aspect to it. Kathy? Um, yeah, well, you did a perfect segue and, 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 and as did Sean, I think you've categorized all of these under additional priorities as if they were um, budget spending. And I noticed the way it was written last year, you wove different things in, in terms of meeting different kinds of things. But I think um, if additional funds, this question, if additional funds become available, um, to the extent there, this notion of an investment now that would save us money later um, falls into here, you know, so some, some kind of priority setting where um, last year we already talked about a priority of where you would spend it for second and third, but it's an, it's a list of the, the next places. So, you know, if, if we're about to have a disaster in some part of the current operating budget, that's the one Sean just said, we might have to put some money in, but we, if we could invest in something that we can see a clear savings within the next few years. Um, and I know we're not doing enterprise funds, but we had 
a brief discussion on the Centennial plant, that if the design of the plant could also think about solar, how much would it save in the electrical costs? And Guilford gave us the annual electric costs of operating that plant, which were enormous. Um, you know, so I just, so that, that kind of notion that there might be some things that we could be um, prioritizing that way. So I'm, I don't wanna write this too long here, but I think it's just a sentence and you've already got these efficiencies. And this is where grants help you a lot that if, if getting a grant, we just got that grant for the fire, um, tr for the ambulance, it will save us probably wear and tear and it will save us gasoline and it will save us in a way. So that grant made total sense to get. Um, and we don't always get grants that had that clear payoff to our operating budget or um, long-term life of something. So I don't see how this lead sentence, the way you have it organized, we can fix that later, but um, additional priorities. We're, you know, the four big capital projects, all of racial justice, all of everything. It, it doesn't all fit neatly under that, but um, seizing opportunities would um, as a way of rewording it when we actually write the sentences. I think that what we're kind of evolving to is uh, the understanding that and that Sean started us out with this way when we, as a council, identified six areas that we would like the manager to pay attention to. We, there was sort of a recognition that some would require additional funding, some might save money, and uh, some are just incorporated within how you do business within current operations. And uh, I think we can uh, sort of point that out as an overarching thing, but I, uh, I'm, I, I would be hesitant, but I don't know how the rest of you feel, which is why we're having a meeting. Uh, I would be hesitant to have the um, guidelines ignore this other document that we worked on very hard as a council, the uh, priorities for the town manager for the next year. Yeah, I, I guess I didn't mean to ignore it, but I looked at the way you wove it in last time. You, um, and it's not, it's as you just said, it's not just budget. So it's within the budget areas of each of these priorities. These are, these are the top priorities to be worried about. I mean, we didn't make a priority, um, excellent education, right? But we, you know, maintain our reputation, our school's reputation. So it's, it's, we were talking about new focuses or renewed focuses. Yeah. So, uh, but that's why this, this started out as being additional. And you're right, I probably could have come up with a better word. Sean, did you have something else? Mingano, see your oh. hand. Oh, sorry. I will, um, I got to put it down. Oh, okay. So is there anything else that people want to say on this topic or we'll go on, keep moving through the list? So... I have to go back, I can get mine up too. Um, so we uh, had a little bit of discussion already in use of reserves. I think that the other use of reserves question that was sort of implicit in, uh, or I should say explicit in the uh, uh, presentation that was made by um, Paul and others at the financial trends meeting, was that if we make, um, uh, if, if our revenues don't arrive as they are um, anticipated, that uh, that's where we consider using reserves as was uh, suggested for this current year, that if we didn't get the state aid increase that we were committed to using reserves at that point. 
but we had decided even in the um, May um, second round of the guidelines that we would only use reserves if there was a fall off in the revenue um, so that the budgets were being developed that we would try and at that point hold to those budgets. Um, so is there anything else that you would think, suggest that we put in on, under the topic of reserves? Kathy? Um, just to connect it back with the four projects that, um, and the third would be, um, you know, not for operations, except if there's a shortfall and hold on to them for the expected need as uh, we embark on the big capital projects, you know, to reemphasize that we built them up to help be a support for that. That was pretty strongly stated in the uh, guidelines this year, the pre-COVID January guidelines. Yeah, so, so just so people understand it wasn't like we, we are, we're planning to die with and bequeath it to our beneficiaries. I just suggest for people who haven't had a chance to do so um, recently to go back and look at how we addressed it in the January guidelines, because I think it's pretty much the same thing that you just said. Yep. No, I, I think it was well expressed there, but I just was putting it since we're doing rough outlines here. Anything else that people want to um, add on this topic? Yeah, I do want to mention one thing. There was a discussion during um, the uh, financial indicators meeting as to whether or not we should be looking at um, the level that's put aside for capital and the, also a question of, as to whether or not we should review the um, maximum minimum that has been out there for a while. That Sonia was, was the person that brought both of those up. Yeah, I don't know, Sonia, if you wanna chime in. Um, the second one that you mentioned, um, I think I said, you know, a few months ago, we are reviewing our financial policies that are out there and, and we'll come back to you at some point. Um, that is one of the areas that we've looked at and have some thoughts on about what that right level of reserves is, um, both for the operating budget, the general fund, but also for enterprise funds as well, because I know that conversation came up. Um, so at some point, we'll be talking more about that. Yeah, being the uh, one of the sole survivors of that 2007 process that led to those uh, uh, current policies, I have to say that uh, at that point in time, our reserves were pretty low and uh, we were trying to use best judgment to come up with that five and 15%. But in the end, there was no magic when we were barely at 5% to what we did. Uh, you know, Andy, I'll just say that, the, you know, for the most part, the, the base that you guys created was really, really good and really strong and set, you know, a nice um, structure. So really we just went through it and sort of said, that, you know, now that we are where we are, does that change what we want to set for policies essentially? Um, but no, I think much of what you guys worked on is still very much um, relevant to where we are. Anything else that people want to say about reserves? There's one other thing, and that gets back to an item that Bob raised at the very beginning, which was the reminder that reserves are not available for, um, should not be made available for current in, um, programs that would um, create recurring demands. Um, and you did it, and I think it was stated fairly specifically in the example 
that Bob gave about uh, collective bargaining. So we might want to just say salaries um, as an example, as opposed to put it on the unions. Do we want to revisit the proposed maintain reserves at the capital at 8% or do we just want to reinforce that or what do we want to say about that? I was going to put that, I was going to bring that up when we got to number seven, but or it was seven or eight. I can't even remember if it was eight. Number but eight in, in your current list is number eight. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, what happened to it? Right there. Number nine. Okay, it became number nine. Okay, thanks. Yeah, maintenance in there, and I can move maintenance if that helps. That's all right. No, it's all right. The numbers, the numbers didn't have any magic. They were, they were thought. <laughs> um, question of override. I think that our general feeling has been to, we're trying to avoid operating overrides recognizing that we may need to go to voters for a uh, debt exclusion override for most likely for a school and that um, there's a limit to how many times you can ask voters to consider increasing their taxes especially now but I think that's been had been the thought previously okay I have Um, just yeah, go ahead. Um, I just I would prefer not saying may need to go to voters for an override for the elementary school explicitly. Last time we said an override for at least one of the projects or one to two because I think the jury is out. Um, on we we have a cho we have choices um, and. You know, I'm, I'm not going to jump right in on what I think is affordable or not, but if we were at eight or nine percent, um, depending on what we do with the library, we might be able to squeak out with the school. But I just think we're going to have to confront, are we talking about one or two overrides and do we need to protect the schools by, you know, right? So I just wouldn't mention which project it is. And the, the last year version said we think we might have to do it for something. <laughs> and we're hoping we get started on one of these in FY21, which we clearly didn't. Um, you know, so do we, do we think we're gonna start on one of these big projects in FY22, so. I actually agree with Kathy because I think that we don't wanna, um, we don't want the council to feel like they're voting today if, when they vote the guidelines. Yep. That's a good decision. Yeah, so I, I just wouldn't name what we think we, we're going to have to do, but it, it says, you know, use the override for big capital projects is the a good way to phrase it, leaving it nice and vague as to which, or absolutely. Okay. Uh, Bob? Yeah, um, in, in the meeting last week, um, one of the counselors, I don't remember, I can't remember whom, uh, raised the question about whether our debt service is at the optimal level. And do we want to address that here? I mean, we could put in something to the effect to say, we don't think it's good to take on more debt now because we've got these big projects or just stay silent on it. That was the, the chair of the library trustees is the one oh, who raised Right, sorry. That was Austin, yeah, who raised that. I, I'm trying to understand the statement because, in fact, any one of the capital projects that's out there means we are going to take on more debt. If what Austin was saying, don't take on anything else because we want to save it for the library, that's a different statement than we shouldn't take on any more debt. I I think it was a, I shouldn't, I'll, I'll use a, a neutral word. I think it wasn't that he wasn't completely clear in his own mind because he was saying, why not 
do this and didn't understand that we were saying, we weren't saying we are not going to do debt. We're just going to say we're not going to ramp up on debt before we do the big projects because then we won't be able to afford them. So I, I thought it would be good to actually follow up with him that it's not that we're not planning on taking on debt. It's just we're reserving the room to take on debt for the big projects and not eating it all up with financing everything with debt. So yeah. Sean, Sean has his hand up on this. Yeah, I mean, again, we can all try to interpret what he said. I mean, my interpretation was um, that, you know, we often show those slides about how low our debt is and how low a percentage of debt we have. Um, and I think his, you know, remarks were based on, you know, is that really a good thing? Um, and I don't think it's, you know, for, for your purposes, um, I don't think it's a bad thing to have low debt, but again, um, debt service um, costs are, you know, at an all time low or, you know, historic lows right now. So whatever you put in here, you may want to acknowledge that it now is actually maybe a smart time to use debt because of how low rates are. Um, and that, you know, as we prepare for these large projects or if there are other large capital projects within capital, you know, where it makes sense to use debt, again, now relative to history is, is one of the more advantageous times, um, especially given how low our, our debt is in general. Um, we wouldn't put that under override or, I mean, we put that concept goes in somewhere, yeah, right? Yeah, that would go under maybe other capital needs potentially um, or its own section, or you can leave it out altogether, whatever you guys want to do. But that was my interpretation is, you know, acknowledge, understanding how low interest costs are right now is not necessarily a good thing that we have really low debt because we're not taking advantage of those low interest rates. So, yeah. But we do use debt for some of the smaller capital projects. I mean, right. the capital, capital expenditures, you know, that come off the capital plan get bundled. And uh, this is uh, some short-term debt uh, that, that's in there versus the long-term debt that requires uh, bonding. And I think there's a difference there that, uh, that uh, needs to be emphasized. I mean, little, what we're talking about for the large capital projects means a bond that commits the town to a 20 year or greater period, as opposed to the um, one to five year borrowing that goes on to, to you know, buy some of the equipment we need. Now, I just, um, just on how low they are right now, I was just looking 20 year is around 2% yeah. and 30 years around two and a half for in Massachusetts for municipals. It re, 10 years looks like a bargain. You know, like, you don't have to. <laughs> we, we my have, brother, um, my yeah. brother, work, my brother works in finance in the company he works for, um, uh, manages money for large corporations and wealthy individuals. And he's going nuts at the return on the bonds. Um, he, he can't offer people a lot of, return on their investment, the bond market, and the, and the muni bond market right now. The other thing too, about avoiding um, operating overrides, operating overrides almost invariably fail. If you look at the, uh, the list of overrides that DOR maintains, um, <laughs> the success rate is about a 10% success rate for an operating override. Mm -hmm. um, people are much more comfortable funding and over using an override for a capital project where they know they're gonna see something on the ground and they know it's gonna be paid off in uh, a, a certain amount of time. So mm -hmm. voters are more, way more comfortable with an override for a capital project, unless you're a Charlemont and you wanna buy an ambulance. Uh, yeah, no, thank you for that point. And as far as the uh, getting back to the um, debt, limit uh, and then I'm going to call on Dorothy. Uh, you know, we had a um, policy that goes back to my select board days and with Sandy Pooler was the uh, finance director that we were trying to deliberately not take out debt and let um, debt that we had paid off get paid off in full and expire so that we would have capacity for major projects. Mm. Um, and uh, so the fact that we have low debt was actually um, a designed policy um, for very for that purpose. Dorothy? Yes, I just wanted to comment, thinking back on our own financial life, uh, how you get in trouble 
and you get in trouble when they offer you 0% for a year, refinance all your money, and you won't have to pay any interest for a year, and then you go borrow money. And yes, it's cheap, our interest is cheap, but you still end up owing the money. And um, thinking of the, the uh, financial crashes that we've had in our adult life, and they are usually preceded by a moment of euphoria, like, oh my God, it's so cheap to borrow now, let's just go do it. And then you do it and you find that the debt can last longer than the thing you did with the debt. So I just want to, to tamper the enthusiasm is what I want to do. Well, those are decisions that we're going to have as we go along and discussion that as we make decisions about debt going forward. Uh, not sure it's easy to put that in because this guideline is about the budget. It's not about uh, future decisions that need to, that are going to be made. Uh, anything else on this topic? Because then I uh, should move on to capital. Uh, there's, I think we can lump the two capital together if we want, but uh, we've really talked a little bit about the four major capital projects earlier when we were talking about the uh, the town manager goals and what we uh, yeah I, I'm kind of I'm going to encourage that we not try to get into a long engaged conversation on this one the four capital projects are still out there okay it's not an operating budget question for the year yeah right So, um, are we? Do we want to? Uh, the recommendation that was in the uh, financial trend recommendations was: do we stay with the eight percent, or do we go to eight percent, get back up to eight percent? And that would go under the other capital needs. Um, or it goes under number nine, whichever. We're going to reorganize this anyway. Right. It's the eight. It's the recommendation from the financial trends report that was where eight percent came from. Do you want reactions to that? Yeah. <laughs> Well, as far as I could see, 8% was the remainder. Um, you know, once they, once we did flat budgets uh, with the assumptions that we had on, you know, property tax revenue and revenue from other sources, we were left with enough to put 8% in. So to me, it's 8% is doable if all the other things happen. And do we stay at 8% if we need to dip into reserves because there are revenue shortfalls. You know, last year we clobbered capital, so we couldn't go much lower than we went. So the one question I would have is, is that, do we dip first into reserves to maintain services if, if state aid, or do we go back down on eight? And I think I would, sort of stay with the eight because of the queued up, the roads, the sidewalks, uh, the queue that we didn't spend money on last year. But I'd love to see what the queue looks like because some things moved off the ask list over into the Community Preservation Act budget. Some things that were on the list that we didn't get to in JCPC are now over at CPA the front steps of the town hall, various roofs all moved over to another place. So that's just a question, you know, do would we, if there's a state revenue aid fall, do we first go to reserves or would we say we can't go to 8%, we're gonna need to be at seven and a half. I'm asking it as a question. 
Um, I think I'd rather stay at eight. John has his hand up. Is it okay, Andy, if I respond to that? Yes. Um, so I can see why maybe it looks like a plug figure because sometimes the the eight percent is a weird comes out to a weird number. But the eight percent was actually pretty intentional this year. Um, you know, we looked at what was deferred, what was coming up for FY twenty two anyway, and eight percent helped us get through a lot of it. So the um, so the eight percent was actually intentional as a percentage that we thought could get us back on track um, and and make a lot of progress towards getting back to the ten percent. Um, but I agree with you, it, we're actually getting in better shape because there's a lot of projects. The ambulance was on the capital plan. We were able to do that out of the ambulance receipts fund. Um, there was a fire truck that we end, were able to buy out of a gift. Um, so the, the plan actually looks a little better than probably the last time uh, the group has seen it. Um, so I would also just, I would, I think capital is a really important part for this uh, component for this year. So I would agree with Kathy, it's sticking with 8%. Um, and not dipping into that, you know, to whatever extent we can. If something catastrophic happens, I think it's a different story, but I think we really need to emphasize capital for this year's proposal. Andy, I'd like to stay. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not seeing you uh, because I've, let me move my participant list covering the figures. Yeah, go ahead. I totally agree with this. There is a point where we cannot continue to ignore repairs and new buildings are frankly, they're, all, they're just gonna come back and bite us. And so we, if it means we can't maintain some programs at the desired levels, it, that's what it means. But if we end up with a school building that we can't even occupy or a DPW or a fire station that we can't even repair anymore, which is about where we are, by the way, um, then we've, we've gained nothing. So I really don't want to see us dip below 8%. And I felt like Sean just gave us words that 8%, at 8%, we can cover some end month needs that we weren't able to do the year before, and we can get we can get somewhere rather than it's a drop in the bucket. Um, it is a drop in the bucket, but nevertheless, you know, it's, it's real money. Um, so uh, if there's agreement on that, uh, we should go on. Because I think, I think that the challenge is gonna be in the writing of it, but I, Kathy and I work out the writing, we probably will get it fairly well, hopefully. So anything else to be said on capital on any pieces of the capital at this point? Andy, um, now might be a good time if you're if you um, want for Sony and I to maybe weigh in on the, the maintenance fund and it sort of relates to the solar fund. Okay. Uh, so so I'll let Sonia correct me if I'm wrong, but um, you know, the best vehicle or maybe not the best vehicle, but one vehicle that could be explored for, you know, accomplishing those types of things could be, um, you know, like a capital stabilization fund. Um, several years ago, there was discussion around a capital stabilization fund. I think town meeting ultimately decided not to do it. Um, they wanted just to stick with a single stabilization fund. But one way to sort of set aside funds specifically for capital, um, you know, and when I think maintenance fund, I think maybe large scale capital or large scale maintenance, like a new roof or new windows or HVAC work or something like that, um, which could also apply to solar, which, you know, is a lot, could be large scale mm -hmm. capital projects, um, could be to consider a capital stabilization fund. And then the challenge would be, how do we put money into it? Um, but that would be one way to sort of isolate money specifically for those things. Sonia, does that, um, yeah, I don't really, I don't really know what you're referring to with solar for capital funds. So if we wanted to, if the town wanted to make a, you know, set aside funds for sustainability initiatives such as solar, which would be, you know, capital because of the cost of it, depending on how it's financed. I mean, okay, so but you're not designating revenues from solar to go in there. No, 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 no. This would be, this would be. So, so it would solar, just be a vote from free cash basically to a stabilization fund. Right. Yeah, so this would be for the cost of solar or the cost of a sustainability initiative if we were to uh, pay for something. 
Um, but that would depend on the specific arrangement. So we kind of, that's why I was a little confused about what you're talking about with maintenance funds, because that's what our stabilization fund is. It's, it's for capital. I mean, we can create as many stabilization funds as you want, but it's for any lawful purpose. And I thought that was our purpose was to have it for if you had to do a roof, or if you had um, some repairs in a building that you needed to do. I know we were, we were building our reserves also for the peak um, debt service on these four capital projects. But in my mind, that's what the purpose of it is, other than having a rainy day fund for, this is where I, this is where I wanted to sit. I said that I wanted to, that we should consider raising the bottom limit of the stabilization fund to 15% and never go below that so that we have it for a rainy day fund, but everything else to be for that maintenance fund. Yeah, no, I, I think that's the, the right discussion is how do we know what's for the rainy day fund and what is for capital? And right now it's sort of all together and whether it's another fund or maybe maybe it's something within the, um, the policies that kind of state that maybe there's a way to get to it that way as well. Yeah, I just don't know if there's a misconception out there that the stabilization fund is for all the large capital pro projects. Well, to some extent it is, if you go back to the point that uh, Sean started with, which was when Sandy went to town meeting when he was finance director and recommended the creation of a capital stabilization fund, what he was trying to do was to say, we have these major building projects and part of the reason that we are putting aside um, the level of reserves we are is because we need to um, have that available for capital purposes. And town meeting, um, they had speakers who said, but we always have the choice to use this uh, stabilization fund for those purposes. So why do we need to have it isolated into a separate fund? And uh, rejected that proposal. But that was the discussion at town meeting. Yeah, yeah. What am I supposed to be communicating here? Lynn, just write exactly what we said. It was very clear, wasn't it? <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> um, I thought it was too. Yeah, no, we were kind of we kind of had a discussion there. I mean, I don't know what the so all of that was to say, you know, was in response to the maintenance fund and the the setting aside resources for maintenance, um, but and also setting aside funds for solar that, you know, maybe the guidelines could be that we explore ways to do it um, or continue exploring ways to, to earmark um, or isolate those funds. Yeah, I think that we, I'm gonna uh, go back to the people who raised hands uh, after I, uh, in just a second, but um, it's, it's sort of like the percent for art discussion that got us into so much trouble with the legislature. Uh, there's, uh, limits the Department of Revenue has on how you can go ahead, go about doing these sorts of things. And uh, who, what the problem was is a town meeting and that one created an expectation that was unmeetable uh, in DOR's mind. Kathy and then Bernie. Hey, I, I'm really happy with the explore ways to achieve this, you know, give us a memo back. Um, and Sonia, I completely agree that the stabilization fund is earmarked this way, but I also saw us dip into it to buy Hickory Ridge. Um, and it was a once in a lifetime opportunity to buy a piece of land. And so it's clearly was not um, maintaining capital, fixing capital, it was because the money was there. And so I think um, to the extent we, um, we now have this first time you can, those with long histories can correct me, but we had this capital reserve fund because we couldn't figure out how to allocate it this year because it's so small, but it can only be used for capital projects on a urgent need basis. And um, if we don't use it all, I'm not sure what happens to it, but I like the idea that we somehow recognize that there's a certain amount of maintenance that has to happen every year. So giving us a memo back on how do we uh, not buy the new truck if we haven't 
fix the roof or we don't, you know, it's a back and forth on some of these, you know, force us to stay with the um, fix it. Um, I don't know how we got to the point on the North Commons that the sidewalks are crumbling under your feet and jagged edges, but we clearly didn't have a fix the sidewalk fund um, available to repair existing sidewalks. So it's uh, getting a memo back on which kind, what are possible ways to do something like this um, to sequester money um, uh, where the project itself can't finance, it can be financed, but then we've got the later remains of it to keep it, to the upkeep is, is on our budget. Sonia, so, you know, it's, so you don't have to answer it right now, but there must be some way of making us live up to our, we intend to do this. Um, I just want to clarify that if, if um, I confuse everyone, I didn't say that this um, stabilization fund was just for maintenance fund. It is for all of the above. It's any lawful purpose. So taking money out to buy, um, what do we take money out for? Hickory Ridge. That's, that's perfectly fine to do that here. I'm just saying if we build our reserves enough that we can we can either have separate stabilization funds so it's clear to everybody or we can have a spreadsheet saying you know we're putting 10 percent for this 10 percent for this and whatever we put in there we can designate which bucket it's going into but um it wasn't all meant for um maintenance right. but i do think there's a uh, question that um and Sonia, if I have this wrong, say so that the capital stabilization fund that was established this year was just a term of art to be used to say, we're gonna have this bucket of funds that is gonna be available for capital needs during FY21. And um, the town manager would make recommendations on purchases to be made from that piece of funds. But at the end of 21, it's not spent, it reverts to free cash and then can be reallocated for the next year, but it, okay. it's not a fund that has a lifetime after FY21. It does, actually it does. Um, it's not a stabilization fund, it's just a budgeted reserve. We didn't know which projects to, to actually um, put forth, so we just put that pot of money into a capital and it's just, it's on the, it's on the, um, General, general ledger and it's just called reserve fund and it's, it's the seven hundred thousand dollars it's just like repurposing old capital it'll stay there you can take it it's a funding source so you can you can carry that funding source over into next year if we don't spend it we can fund some of those per some of those things that we um that we didn't fund for fiscal year 21. So, so it doesn't um, go away. I mean, it can, I can close it out. It can fall to free cash. And if it free cash is over 5%, we can move it to stabilization fund, like our um, policies say. But it, it's, it's just a budgeted reserve. It is so available. How long could you have a budgeted reserve continue? Um, as long as we want it. Forever. So you can just roll it over year to year to year. Right. The deal doesn't like that really much. Do you and know? I just had this conversation with our auditors um, about three weeks ago about that budgeted reserve to make sure I was treating it correctly and they were on board with everything I said. So okay. it's budgeted reserve, it is there. You do have to appropriate it. You do have to appropriate it to the specific projects. So it would have to go as a council order saying that we're going to um, fix the North Amherst school roof and the funding sources from this budgeted reserve. So if the council, and then I'm going to turn to Bernie because I know your hand's been up. Um, if the council wanted to do what was suggested earlier in this discussion, which was set aside money for maintaining projects that we undertake uh, in the future. We build a new um, school and we wanna have funds to maintain it. You could set, a, set up a budgeted reserve to do exactly that. Yeah, I don't know, you know, I don't know 
if they would be fine with millions of dollars sitting there, but in this way, what you could, what you could do also on a capital plan, you could also have a budgeted reserve every year. And if you don't use it at the end of the year, you transfer it to a stabilization, a capital stabilization fund. You could do that too. There's a, there's flexibility there. So if you take 10% of, of levy for capital and you allocated everything you need for capital and there's say $500,000, you can move it. You can either budget a, budget a an amount to go into the stabilization fund for capital, whether it be a capital or you can leave it in the reserve, but in the um, capital fund, but the auditors expect you to spend that they don't expect you for it to sit there. I mean, it's one thing to have a few hundred thousand dollars, but if what I'm hearing from you is to maybe have a million dollars or more build up there. Oh, I'm sorry, Andy. Lynn, and Bernie has his hand up too. Um, so, I mean, years ago, I was the treasurer for my condominium association and we had various reserves, replace the roof, et cetera, et cetera. Some of these were long-term projects because obviously you don't put a new roof on every year. Mm -hmm. We're talking about? Well, right now, the way I'm looking at the budget, the budget of reserve that's in there for capital, it's for all, for it's any, for any one of those capital projects that we didn't fund for fiscal year 21. So, I mean, that was my, that was our intent when we did this reserve, right, Sean, is to fund some of those capital projects is, and to have it as a reserve that way. So if something came up as an emergency, we would fund it with that. Yeah, I don't think we would want to do this type of reserve for a long term. Right. This year because we anticipated we might need to spend those funds this year. Again, if we were going to do something for the long term, it would probably be in a capital stabilization fund or a you know a regular stabilization fund. You just yeah, uh, transfer it to stabilization fund. Okay, uh, Bernie. Yeah, um, part of the thought behind the capital stabilization fund when Sandy was here was to send a signal to the bond markets um, that we understood that we had certain long-term capital needs that we were setting money aside for and that we were prepared to fund a portion of those. So you sort of disambiguate, you, rather than having this massive um, uh, stabilization fund that has a bunch of stuff, a bunch of, of purposes tied into it, um, you, you isolate your, the money that you have for capital so that you signal the bond market that you're, you're prepared to pay for this project and, and that there's a fund there that's not competing with other needs. That's one piece. And, and the same thing actually goes for OBRA, which we'll talk about later. I mean, you really what you're doing is you're signaling the capital markets that you're doing good planning. And that tends to lower your bond, that, that raises your bond rating and lowers your borrowing costs. Um, I, you know, I understand about budgeted reserves. Uh, that was a favorite thing I used to do. The Department of Revenue got very upset with me. They would prefer that I created a million little stabilization funds rather than budget reserves. So I think Sonia's concern about that is well-placed. And I, I, the description that Sonia gave of a stabilization fund is, is the classic definition of it. So, uh, but, but think about, you know, when you think about these stabilization funds, think about the signal you're sending to the bond market. Yeah, that's helpful. Um, so moving along, I think we've pretty much talked about what we want to under uh, capital. Um, so the uh, next question I would have is, uh, are we comfortable with the revenue projections that were in the, that were offered to us? So the last chance to raise questions. I'm comfortable with them, but I also recognize that we may have to go back and revisit them like we did last year. Yeah, I mean, I think that what we're saying. Yeah, go ahead, Kathy. Yeah, just a second, Lynn. Um, we wrote a note in either version one or version two of last year's guidelines to get a report back. I think this is one we're going to need a mid-year report you know, a second quarter report, because it's, um, 
you know, I know we get them anyway, but you know that we 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 keep, stay on top of this because it's the local revenues you have coming back up, not to the previous levels, but coming back up to where they sunk to. And uh, what happens if that doesn't happen is, you know, the, um, we're gonna, so it's just, I. it's a sentence. Yeah, I'm totally comfortable with where they are now. Um, it's just, you're having to do educated guests and Sonia was 100% correct last year. So maybe she'll have another batting average this year <laughs> that she'll be a thousand, she'll be batting a thousand on uh, best guesses, best informed guesses are decent, but you know, UMass in theory is coming back. Um, will COVID ever leave us? Will any of the local restaurants and hotels ever open again? You know, it's a series of, we don't know, right? Um, so, so that's, uh, I would just put a sentence in a sentence somewhere in the report that says, you know, this is the best we can do as of November or December for what we think the world will look like in FY22. Um, okay. Um, is there anything else we want to say about new revenue generation? Other than what we've already did, we had a little discussion earlier. I actually I want to weigh in here because well this may seem this may be an area that the town manager needs to communicate to the town council in a much more deliberate way. In all of the inquiries I've done into the town, much of the grant writing is actually decentralized. So for example, the police department may be writing certain grants and planning may be writing other grants and DPA, DPW may be writing road grants. So I'm, um, it's not clear to me, and I, I also will just bluntly tell you, I lived in a pure grant and contract world for much of my career. It never worked out to have a single person kind of being the grant getter because somebody who knows highways can write a much better proposal for DPW. And likewise, somebody who knows policing can do the same. If you're looking for somebody who can help coordinate some of that, yes, my organization ended up finally hiring somebody who is just outstanding at that. Um, so I, I just want to be clear that we don't think that a single person should be the expert in those various fields of town services. But more importantly, what I do think we have to watch out for is having grants commit other town funds without understanding completely grants. And, and I, you know, I think we are all very, very well aware that the previous legislative body, the town of Amherst committed to a proposal for a library. And we are now trying to figure out how we're gonna deal with that. And that's an example of looking at what is the proposal that is going in really asking of the organization? And are we well aware in advance and looking at the impact of that commit, that matching commitment? So my two cents worth here. John? Yeah, I just uh, wanted to confirm exactly what Lynn said. That is that is our structure. The grant writing is decentralized. Uh, when opportunities arise that you know align with the department's um, initiatives, they apply for them. And we have a central person in accounting, um, Holly Bowser, as most of you know, um, who helps the facilitation of the grant or the administrative side of the grant in terms of um, applying for it and managing the reports and um, supporting you know, keeping the files and things of the, that nature. Um, but in general, the actual seeking of grants is done by each department. There's another thing that's under I, which is uh, 
we've no indication and I'm not asking for one right now that but that in the budget development process that the manager will make the decision to go ahead and hire an economic development director unless he's explicitly said it to somebody else I have not heard that and when you have a vacancy and a tight budget in your, um, as we do for this coming year, something that at least you'd expect them to think about. I, I added that sentence and I'm perfectly happy to take it out. You know, that A, it assumes we have one and B, Lynn's term on, I always meant coordinating rather than this is the one person who does it. But if we don't have that person and we're not likely to have them in FY22 um, or F or current. Um, yeah, yeah. So that, so I didn't mean to jump that. I just, I, I don't know whether there are opportunities out there that we don't know about or if everybody's radar screen is up. I do think being strategic, everything we've said, I think is right about grants. Grants shouldn't drive our spending later. We should be going after grants that are already totally in line with things we want to do. Um, yeah, the, the, the reason I don't actually, I, I want to leave it here. I don't know how we're going to address it in the guidelines, but the business community is very focused on somehow or another we should hire an economic development director and that person should be going after grants to improve downtown, for example. So this is a, this is a conversation that's larger than you know, the group of us sitting here. Okay. It, it, sometimes I think there's a, um, probably a way overblown expectation of what that person could possibly do. Yep. Don, keep your hands up. Oh, sorry, I will lower it. Okay, I didn't know if you had anything to add to this. Um, I think we're getting towards the end um, to the numbers. Uh, is there anybody, any reason that anyone wants to do other than has been done in prior years and is done in this year's suggested guidelines of having even percentage increases recommended for each of the segments with the adjustment for the schools for the reasons that we all know about now? We're, we're, we're saying flat budgets, right? budgets across the board and uh, with the stated somewhat differently for the elementary schools because of the whole question of how we account for the um, charter. The charter? Charter schools. Charter. Not, yeah. not, not the town charter, charter schools. Andy, can I just say a quick thing about this one? Can I, um, can I say a quick piece? Yeah. Um, I do think that this is a really important one that um, the increases are equal for each department. I, you know, working on the school side before and now on the town side, I think this really helps all the departments feel like part of one larger unit and not competing with each other. Um, you know, I've heard of other towns that it can get pretty ugly and we have not had that. We all work really well together. And I think a lot of that is because of this and in the past, when one department has struggled, had something unusual, there has been flexibility. And I think everyone has been open to that flexibility. But in general, um, the equal increases for departments, I think, has really helped the town um, be cohesive and, and smart with um, our operations. It also helps with the four towns meeting, being the one who's spoken for the town at four towns meetings to explain that it's an equal percentage. But it was, I think I had to put it on the list. Yeah. Anyone else? OPEB, I think we've talked about earlier that uh, Bernie uh, gave us a strong reason why we support the OPEB uh, recommendation. And I think it's consistent with what uh, 
town manager told us at the financial trends meeting. We're planning to move this back up, aren't we? Yeah, so this is a, a selfish one, uh, Andy, would be if, again, revenues come in better, you know, OPEB would be one area we would look to get our contributions back up to uh, where we were before. Because um, we did reduce it by 50% um, for FY21. Do we want to state that in the draft guidelines in some fashion? I would yeah, I mean, it's a tool. Yes. Yeah, I think the same way you said it, the other one, where again, if, if funds become available, this would be one of the areas to consider for using those funds. Okay. Um, so um, then we get to the, uh, this is a question we could come to later, but uh, is there anything that we would like to say to uh, the manager when you present the budget, we would like you to include information about this? Um, Mary Lou is always um, anxious to have a state, uh, something in there about how town departments work together and about staffing levels were her were things that she always wanted to have and that uh, in the finance committee guidelines, Bernie, you'll be able to remember those days. Uh, Sean, when we got finished with this year's budget, you specifically asked us, were there things that we would like to see in the new and future budget documents? And I'm assuming that that continues to be something you're looking at. Yes, yeah, so I did get some feedback um, from at least one counselor of a few areas and we are um, taking things that we've heard at different points during budget meetings um, and trying to incorporate them into the budget document. So um, hopefully this year's budget document just naturally will have some more information in it. Um, hopefully that's responsive to things you guys have asked about. Yeah, when I was on the finance committee, the old finance committee used to talk about um, problems that we never could resolve, which was how to compare staffing levels where there's um, departments like the library that has a lot of part-time employees and uh, different departments measure uh, percentage of FTE differently. And there wasn't, there didn't seem to be consistency in how personnel was measured. Uh, Kathy? No, I think one of the other suggestions, I'll have to go get my notes, Sean, but one of the other was um, to the extent departments have done been doing something around energy efficiency to write some sentences about it, re reducing greenhouse gas, converting, putting solar panels on that, that they note where they have done something. Um, you yeah, know. Um, so that's, that's something um, I'll, I'll note. The, the explicit way we've done that, that's new for this year's budget, is more around capital. In the capital request, we've explicitly asked the impact of whatever people have submitted, what the impact is on the town sustainability goals. Um, but in terms of other things that are not maybe explicitly capital, that's something we can look into. Okay. Anything else? So we dropped the segment about um, how departments help each other. No, I'm willing to put it in. Um... All right, I'll, I'll uh, take a look at the language from this year's, uh, from the FY21 guidelines from January that I sent you earlier, and I will use that language again. If you have any thoughts about it, shoot me an email. Okay. 
and we'll just go on. Dorothy. Um, perhaps this is the same idea or slightly different that um, what we've been doing during this COVID thing or what the town manager has been doing is he's been repurposing, reassigning a salary uh, of uh, workers as needed to meet the needs of the town. Um, so uh, keeping flexibility and responsibility and keeping people working as opposed to layoffs. Um, I mean, I think that's been something very good that's been happening. So I, I wouldn't, I don't, I'm not suggesting language, but um, commitment to the, to the staff and um, uh, it's um, working in a responsible and flexible manner to meet the town's needs, something like that. It's a good point. I think we can, it may not go into this section. It may go elsewhere mm -hmm. in the guidelines, but it's a good point to get into the guidelines. Yeah, well, keeping people working, even if they're working out of their ordinary job, has, at least to this random staff I've spoken with, has, has made um, employees feel valued and um, has, if anything, has, has helped, uh, uh, helped them in terms of their, their seeing the town as, a, as, a, as, a, and as, as an employer in a very positive light. Yeah. It's, been a, it's been a good thing for morale. People feel valued. So um, I'm trying to keep us moving along, being conscious of the time. Bob, is there anything else in the collective bargaining agreements that you would like to see added that we haven't already talked about? Since you uh, I would just reword that um, to say salaries and benefits as a percentage of uh, overall budget or something just at the end of it yeah <clears throat> broad limit on salaries and benefits benefit costs actually as yeah. a percentage of overall budget or something yeah um can i just mention that there are people who are not in bargaining units and so when we talk about collective bargaining, we also need to recognize that the non-bargaining units need to be kept in a parallel step. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah, I didn't mean to limit it to the collective. I, I just didn't know where else to put it, but. <laughs> um. I wonder if we should uh, put, say, uh, compensation section of budgets as opposed to collective bargaining agreements so that uh, it doesn't appear to be um, focused on the unionized uh, positions. So should we just say compensation of staff or what is it you wanted to say? Yeah, I think that's fine. Yeah, I, I just, the, the, the reason I'm suggesting this is that you, as you know, the, you, you, the, we don't know what's gonna happen with healthcare costs, with you know pension costs and, you know, that stuff can get out of hand real fast if you don't have some things to say, hey, wait a minute, we only have this amount of money to spend this year. How are we going to do it? So that's all. Yeah, and I think that the other is um, we'll have to make sure that when we get to the reserves, back to the reserve section, to include something in the reserve section too, getting back to that it shouldn't be used to bleed into operating budgets in any way, including compensation, because it is a recurring cost aspect. Uh, in the community safety and social justice we've talked about, and I want to come back to uh, when we, but I think the, uh, let me go back to see a couple of hands up before we can draw to a close. Dorothy, did you have something else? Kathy? I did, I left it up. Kathy? Yeah, I, mine is more of an information request. If, if we did not, if there were no new COLAs bargained into bargaining contracts, do, can 
we can, we meaning town staff, can you tell me how much, if no one is laid off, how much does the salary baseline increase because of steps? You know, so mm -hmm. current workforce with no additional money on COLA, but they've got step increases. Does it go up by 1%, one and a half percent? You know, because we were told best guess on health insurance, Bob, is 5%. Um, you know, so I just, you know, there's a flat budget and salary and benefits are some share of it right now. And if nobody gets laid off, I just, I don't have any idea. You know, so I don't know, um, you know, it's, I know the answer will be different from library because they have a lot of part-timers who don't, who do or don't have the same kind of steps. So it's a, it's purely a question. Um, I'd like, to, it's for me to understand how tight is a flat budget. <laughs> so it's, it's an information request, not a, something that goes in this document. Yeah. yeah, I don't, I'm not sure if there's anything, any reason why, but for some reason, including collective bargaining in the guidelines feels funny. Um, it'd be interesting to know if we've done that in past years. Um, you know, I'm just not sure how this intersects with negotiations and things of that nature. Um, and you know, especially if we start getting into specifics like colas and, and things like that, um, it feels a little funny in how that might, again, intersect with, with the departments. Usually, you know, we, the guidelines set, uh, you know, an increase to the departments, um, the town, the school, and then those departments have to obviously work within that, that limit. Um, so again, I, I don't know, I could be wrong. It just, it feels a little, different than past years, but maybe it's not. So it might be something we just want to look at how that's been handled in the past. Um, well, you know, Sean, it's interesting you say that. And I, I just want to, the way this presently states, it says to me, you know, if we think salary should only be 50% of the budget, that's all they should be. To me, this does not say we should limit collective bargaining. I think the way it was stated before, it did imply that. Okay. This yeah, maybe, maybe it's the, the, the wording, if, um, if it's been changed, it's better. Okay. And then this is a statement that does not imply putting our nose into bargaining, but actually just putting the on non-unit staff. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I mean, are you still uncomfortable with this? Because I... I understand your discomfort because I was very uncomfortable with the way it was stated before. Yeah, I mean, I guess, I mean, the other thing I was going to say is this sort of creates questions, but this doesn't actually, we haven't actually discussed what the guidelines are for this particular one. Um, so it's, these are more, you know, for a lot of the other things, you know, we sort of, you know, teased out guidelines. This one is really still in like the question phase of what is that broad limit? Um, and I don't know what information is needed for that, but um, I think that's another reason why this one feels a little different because it's not actually a guideline yet. Mm -hmm. yeah, Andy, can I just comment? Yes. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I mean, I, I deliberately wanted to leave it kind of high level and vague because there are many ways that one can achieve the, the, bent, the, the, the outcome uh, and this, uh, I did not want to um, prejudice any ideas about how to get there, okay? It was just the idea of like anything else, you know, people costs represent roughly 55% of the town's cost. And that's been the same, about the same level for the last 10 years, but it's never been kind of set as a target or a goal or something like that. I'm just suggesting that's something to consider. If it's not something that will be helpful, then I'm happy to just, you know, to, to drop it. Uh, I just w thought it would be helpful as a way to indicate that there are limits to what we can spend on certain things. Yeah, no, 
I think from my point of view, I think that's fine. I, again, I didn't know if, if, if um, is 55% the number that is being set or as the, again, maybe not as a strict limit, but as a target um, or is that still a discussion point? And again, I don't have actually strong thoughts on it right now. I just, that's the part I was missing was what was that specific number that is potentially being recommended as a guideline? Yeah, and, and, and again, I did not want to set a number because I think that should be set by, uh, you know, the town manager, the, the superintendent of schools, et cetera. You know, I mean, it's, it's something that the, those individuals who are responsible for those budgets and for those staff should be the ones who come up with a number in my mind. But again, it was just a thought. So maybe, this one, so maybe this one reads something along the lines of, you know, town manager and staff need to be conscious of what percentage of the overall budget goes towards compensation or, or personnel and benefits um, or something along those lines. Yeah, no, I think that's probably the best approach to take to it because uh, I don't want the guidelines to begin to look like they're trying to uh, get into the collective bargaining process because we're not at the table, we will not be at the table. That's the responsibility of management. So Sean, would you state that again, town and manager and staff need to be? You know, you know should need to be or should be conscient, conscious of the percentage of the budget that goes towards um, personnel and benefits or, or personnel costs. Which I think is is a good one, and we are because that's one of the things our you know when we do our financial indicators we monitor, and I, I you know obviously that generated the the suggestion um, from Bob. So I think that's that's a good one that makes sense. Yeah, I think that's what uh, I was thinking too. Is we needed to come up with the right language to soften it. And I think that's a good way to do it. And, and I'm fine with that. Conscious S-C-I-O-U-S, I think. Is that the right one now? No, we've got conscience now. That's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> All sorts of variations on this one. No. No. Oh, okay. S-C-I-O-U-S, I think. You'll, you'll get it, Lynn. <laughs> yeah. Don't worry, we'll get it. In the U.S. Uh, so uh, beware. <laughs> yeah. It's late. I, I really oh. got it screwed up. So I'm just going to do this. Beware. <laughs> Fix it. Okay. okay. Um, do we want to call this compensation of, sta of staff or do we want to call this personnel? Personnel. <clears throat> And uh, so with that said, I think the only thing that's left is the community safety and social justice. Um, in turning to Pat on this a little bit, since she brought it up at the beginning, uh, can we leave it as we had it in the, for the purpose of the guidelines? And um, do we need to say something in a separate in our report separately from the guidelines about um, filling the two positions and to, before the uh, process is run and uh, just report to the council that we had that discussion? I think that uh, I agree that they should be separated and that. Uh, uh, the council should be informed in the uh, report about us beginning a discussion about it, but the, I don't see it as part of a guideline. So why don't you knock that 16 out of the thing altogether, Lynn? And um, yeah. I'm going to try and handle it separately in the finance committee report. The only, the only, I think it, hmm, I guess then it would have to say something. I guess I think it should be there 
as something that we're looking at during the budgeting process, not specifically the freeze of the two positions, but oh. what costs um, could be connected to community safety um, this next year. And, and I, I don't have an idea of how you... Well, I just want to point out that it's already up in three. As That's the true, yeah. Goals, and it's here as the other part of it. So we've already kind of talked about that. Um, Maybe your stomach's a little uneasy. Okay. We could say so. okay. Let, me, let me just want to make, make one suggestion is to say something um, in the guidelines that we recognize that as uh, budgets are developed around the issues of community um, health and safety, that um, the uh, we hope that uh, we expect that you will be um, conscious of the um, discussions that have taken place within the working group that's been established for that purpose or something like that. So I'll try and write something along those lines. As Thank I you, do. Andy. Okay, so um, is everybody satisfied with, with the discussion that we've had today? Because I think this has been really helpful for uh, making sure that we have a consensus on where we are with the guideline development and gives us the ability to do the draft and get it back to you to look at as a draft in the next time. And we can actually pretty much stay on schedule. So thank you. This has been a great conversation. Um, the uh, other thing that um, I think we needed to talk about um, is an additional item. I think we're down to just, if I'm correct, we're down to one um, item not anticipated left, and that's the SUFA um, grant. And, uh, you know, it is my understanding of what happened is, is that, uh, or what this is about is, is that, uh, there's some money left in the um, CARES Act, which was reported to us in the last finance committee meeting. And that this is a proposal that of uh, how to use the balance uh, of how we could use the balance of the CARES Act funding. Yeah, Sean. Yeah, so I don't I don't think this is a topic that would normally come to finance committee, but maybe because of the how it you know it came up last night is why it's here. Um, quite a, quite some time ago, you know, we were looking at ways to do communication. Um, that's one of the eligible uses for CARES Act, and this was one way that um, was identified as a way of communicating uh, health information to the public. Um, these signs go up in different locations. Um, and we can push content to them so we can change the, you know, if there's anything that changes suddenly, like a new um, health law or health regulation, um, you know, we can push that information to these signs and they, you know, they have a rotation that they push out different types of information. Um, so I know this is something that the town manager and uh, Brianna, who I think presented last night, have been looking at for a while. Um, and I think it, you know, when we first started thinking about it, I don't, you know, I wasn't aware of the public way, you know, issues, but I think that's why it came up last night. Um, and so, so yeah, it's, it's something that we've actually been thinking about using CARES funds. It's just taken a long time to, to get to this point. And we do have to move quite quickly on it if we want it to be able, if we want it to be funded from CARES, um, we have to move pretty quickly because it has to be um, by December 30th is the deadline for spending CARES money. I thought we were talking about the SOFA thing, which were the, which I'm confused right now because I thought the grant was for the bus shelters and that the SUFA stuff was free for a year and we were trying to find out the costs if we were to continue it. Am I, I could be, I'm old. I might I, be. I, 
I could be wrong too, um, Pat. Um, I thought the signs were the, I, I checked out before that part of the meeting last night. So oh, okay. <laughs> uh, I know that the SUFA part that I'm aware of are the signs. Um, I think belt bus shelters, I thought maybe were talked about separately, but maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Yeah. Do you, I'll defer to you guys. They were talked about separately, but one of them had a grant attached to them, which was the bus shelter. Yeah, the, the bus sign. shelters was the, was the downtown grant or okay. the transportation grant, wasn't it? Right. Yeah, I think that sounds right. So maybe I was way off on my original point. Are, are we talking about the the signs? Are we talking? About the, uh, yeah, there were two. There were two different proposals uh, <laughs> that were last night. One was the uh, signs, which is re I'm referring to as SUFA because that's what uh, was uh, being dubbed by Brianna and her presentation. And uh, my understanding of that was is that that was to be CARES Act to three hundred thousand dollars for the first year. And no, um, it's not that. It's not that much. It's um, it's I think around twenty to twenty five thousand um, for a certain number of signs. I don't think it's that expensive. Kathy. Okay, so that was my question that didn't get answered last night. And I, I think what we were asked to do is come up with some questions that when TSO was looking at this, they could get more information. So I want it, even if it's free for us this year, coming year, because I want to know the next year. I want to know if we like it. So we're talking about a one year pilot that's paid for by CARES. Right. If we like it, what would it cost to continue it? And um, what information will we have to make that decision? That's to me was the simplest kind of question. It's a bit like what we've talked about, you know, don't build a building if you can't maintain it. If we think these things are really cool and suddenly we discover, um, is it 20 to $25,000 in year two, three, four, five, six, you know, so are we committed to this? And what was nice about the description is if we hate it, she, she, Brianna kept talking about four bolts into the concrete, four bolts come back out and away it goes. You know, like it's, we're not having to pre-wire it. We're not having to do right. X, Y, and Z with it, that it, they're easily removable. Um, and it was both those get out information signs, but it's also these charging stations. Right, three of them. So, so the charging stations where you can plug in your phone or your iPad while walking around town and the, only question I had about those, and it's not finance at all, but I did, I'm one of the guinea pigs, or maybe everyone had to do with IT security. And I had to go get a badge of what I know and don't know um, from the town, a series of things. And one of that warning was never plug your charging gizmo into a publicly accessible charging station because it can you would be amazed how much of your information it can grab. It was like a don't do it if you have anything that you care about on it. So I thought, oh, um, would these charging stations be a new way for people to siphon our information off? So that was not a financial question, but I had a financing question about both aspects. Um, if we like it, what's year two look like? And is year two through year 10, you know, um, what is the cost? So are we, I'd be happy to have free things for a year so we could assess it and, that, and have them be removable. So I don't have a question about this moving forward, but I think we should do it, go into it with our eyes wide open on if we get enamored with these things. They're in New York now, these little, they're not SUFAs, they're another, and not that many people stop by and read them, but it was, but I think there's no reason not to, to try out something like this. They're, they're super cool. So mine was purely on a year, what will it cost? What's the ongoing contract cost to us of doing this? That and while there, while there are concerns about uh, publicly or accessing or ch the chargers, they were going to be put near, um, the homeless shelter, the Unitarian Church, for people because they're not able now to charge uh, their computers, et cetera, at the library and things that they were doing. No, so. I thought it, it seemed like a good idea. And waiting for a bus stop, you know, was another place, you know, where you could plug in before you got on the bus for a long trip and you forgot to charge your uh, or outside the library, which isn't open now. But 
I wasn't against them. Again, it was purely a what's the cost of keeping them there and keeping them functional over time. Um, yeah, I think those are the kinds of questions. And originally there was some discussion last night about uh, having us do a joint meeting with uh, TSO in conversations that I had with uh, Darcy over the, the uh, part of a day since our meeting. Uh, I think that we concluded that first of all, that's not feasible given the time squeeze of getting the TSO's answer back to the council. Oh, that's right. and, uh, that uh, her preference was is that we identify financial issues that we think are important for TSO to be aware of and to the extent possible that we right. get right. Um, answers back to TSO, uh, which could come directly from staff or could come through us. Yeah, I did go online this morning and just looked up SUFA and tried to get some sense of costs, but I couldn't find anything definitive at all. Uh, so it really may need to go back to Brianna and um, to because she must have access to that information. Yeah, you, Sean, do you have anything on it? Yeah, no, I, I mean, again, I, you know, I'm looking at the what we have and the first year um, cost is 25,000. I think the part that maybe there's some uncertainty is, you know, these signs have the ability to generate revenue as well. And there's some revenue sharing piece to it that can reduce the cost to the town. Um, so I think that's where there might be a little uncertainty in terms of future years, but um, we can try to get more information on what's the base price each year if we don't generate any revenue. And so we can just say that, you know, uh, Darcy asked us to send her her questions. That's my question. So Andy, you can just supply it to Darcy and Brianna so that when TSO reports out, they can tell us. Um, that was it. And the same thing with chargers. I had not just these signs, but the chargers, charging stations. That may not be a finance issue, though. That sounds like social justice. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's security of the charging stations to the people who use them. Bob has his hand up. Yeah. Yep. Uh, my question is who's going to manage the content on this? And I saw in the briefing that they can sell advertising on it. And, and it seems like it's, we're biting off a lot yes. of somebody's time to manage this. And so is that what the $25,000 is, Sean? Yeah, so SUFA manages the content. I believe we have some ability to also sort of vet the content to make sure that there's nothing being put up that we would um, oppose, but SUFA manages the content. But they wouldn't be managing our COVID announcements. So that we would be- would push, of... We would push that. I don't know, I haven't seen the, how the technology works, but we would either push that to them or we would have a way to push that out. But, um, but and, and what I'm looking at right here, it clearly states that SUFA would manage the content. Thanks. Um, I have my hand up. Yes, go ahead. Okay, my, my computer uh, ran out of battery for, for it. So I, was, I missed a little bit of the conversation as I was running around finding plugs and getting back on. Uh, I just wanted to comment that um, I am not in favor of these signs. Uh, I am totally in favor of the charging stations, which are small and look like little tables that could be put near benches. Um, even in the pictures that we saw, it just was some more messy stuff on the street. There's already a lot of messy stuff. There's um, these little real estate things. There's, there's trash cans. I also didn't like the color. That's because they match the waste, waste finding signs, which I don't find attractive. And it'll, I just think it's adding more chaos and it's unnecessary. Um, I think sometimes you, that you get a good idea and it sounds like fun and I, I, I'm not for it, uh, but I am definitely for charging stations um, and the placement of them was, uh, was you know obvious and common sense and was good, but um, just another piece of, of internet content that you don't totally control. Like um, you know, I used to love Instagram. Now they want to put all kinds of things on it. They're putting ads on it, and uh, I, I am it tires me out to have all of these. Yeah, you know, time is tight, and I think it would be helpful if we kept reflecting on issues around finances and not personal opinions about yeah. design. I was say that, 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 um, this will come back to the council. So it's not 
the decision isn't going to be made by TSO. They're only making a recommendation to the council, and um, we're only suggesting the financial aspects that TSO should be considering and uh, information that we can get channeled to them to provide that so that finance isn't ignored. Kathy? So can we ask, um, I'm not going to weigh in on what I think of these, Pat, I agree with you, but can we ask if it's $25,000, um, how much of that is the charging station and how much of it is these info things? And same question for year two and three, you know, so we're getting it as a package deal. If we sever them, does the price tag go up? Just, just something about the two components of what's being proposed and have it as one price tag. But, you know, it might be that if we separate them, the cost of each one is more expensive. I have no idea, but getting it separate as well as together. Um, that had not occurred to me to think of there. There are two, two things we're getting here. Um, that's so what I have is the $25,000. Is that the correct? number the exact, the exact cost is um that i have here is twenty five thousand five hundred and fifty dollars <laughs> it, it does not divide between the signs and the charging elements no it does not decipher between them though no. and that was a question that kathy was asking if it could be provided which is probably something that brianna would have to answer um uh, and uh then the uh, same questions for subsequent years. What is the cost to the town? Do we have do we have ongoing costs that we're going to have to bear once the uh, out of the regular budget once the CARES Act money disappears? And uh, recognizing how tight we expect the budgets to be in the next couple of years, how we feel about that, and how that divides out between the two. Um, the amount of time, staff time that it's going to take to manage this project, and if that that has been considered, um, whether there are other ongoing costs that we're not aware of. Uh, I think those were the basically the questions that came up. Yep. So I will uh, write that as a uh, um, quick memo back to uh, Sean is finance director, Brianna, since she's one, obviously include Paul on it. Sonia, just to let you know that the finance com committee had su is suggesting that these questions be investigated and reported to TSO for their consideration when they meet, uh, uh, or I think it's Thursday, their meeting. It is. Late, like end of day Thursday. No, they're, yes, they're meeting at four. And we are not going to try and join their meeting. We're, we're going to leave it to them. I think that, then that's fine with Darcy. It's Darcy prefers it that way. Great. Okay. Anything else that needs to be considered? Especially since we have a meeting that night too. Yeah, I know we do. We have no public public comment for the sake of uh, the recording of the meeting. I do want to note that we did have time reserved for public comment, but that there's no public in attendance today. So, is there anything else that anyone has? Is if not, um, I think that we can consider ourselves. Uh... Oh, sorry, really quick, Andy. I haven't sent the invitations for the budget forum on Thursday, but I'll be sending invitations to the finance committee members so that they can attend and you can call a meeting of the finance committee together at the budget forum. Okay. And this, um, for uh, Bernie and Bob, you know that this is a, something that's required in the charter each year and is just being placed now so that um, <clears throat> any comments that come from the public um, are heard. And uh, I would expect, but do not know that there um, will be some public comment probably on the police budget. 
Yeah. So uh, you, uh, I think it's just a question of us being able to hear it so that when we look at our final draft guideline discussion that we're aware of what the public had to say. Do you need, do you need a quorum of finance to be there? No. It's a council meeting, so a quorum of council? Yeah, public forums or council meetings. Okay. Just, I've got two conflicts. I'm, I, I'm gonna try to be there for at least part of it, yeah. I think that what we wanted to do um, was again, call it as a finance committee meeting so that uh, the uh, resident members of the finance committee can be more than in the audience. Uh, if we don't do that, then they're left into a different position of being in the audience. Correct. I think it's very nice if we can have it as a finance committee meeting. So we will call it as finance committee meeting so that Bernie and Bob can attend. Okay, so um, nothing else, then uh, I guess we should consider ourselves adjourned at uh, 4.35, I'll call it just around, give it a round number. And uh, we had, a, I think, a very productive meeting. So thank you all. Okay, everybody. Bye-bye, everybody.